It's a great question. In a world that's richer than it's ever been, yet engulfed in more conflict than ever before, more connected but perhaps lonelier than ever before, and in a religious world that can see more focused on marketing and packaging rather than real hurting and real need, many of us are left yearning for God. We want to see Him. So, where is He? Where is God now? Well, hello. We're glad you're here today. We are starting a brand new sermon series here at Church of the Heartland. It's like a mini sermon series, and it's called, Where is God? You know, lots of people have been asking me that exact question. In the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of all the strange things that are happening, all the tragedies that are happening around us, People are asking, where is God in all of this? And today we're going to talk about where he is and what he does. This two-part sermon series, this little mini sermon series we're doing here, is going to be over the book of Job. And I encourage you to read the book of Job over the next two weeks. It's about two or three chapters a day. You'd finish it in time. And uh, just kind of get into that because there's a lot of cool um, things that are hidden in there. Before we get into that, let's, let's open with some prayer. Lord Jesus, we ask you right now, to give us ears to hear, to give us hearts that are open so we can do your will, Lord. They don't want to hear from me today. They want to hear from you today. They want your word to be alive today. So speak into their hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Okay. So the the book of Job is one of the uh, called wisdom books. And it's uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and the book of Job. And the reason it's called a wisdom book is it's not really written in the, in the same way that most of the Bible is written. It's written as a kind of a lyric or a poem, but it's also historical. So we kind of have to look at it both ways. We have to look at it as something that's historical, but it's also written in a lyrical form. So it's flowery in its wording. And uh, so, you know, there's in the book of Psalms, one of the wisdom books, it talks about us being under the the, the wings of God. Well, God does not have wings necessarily. It's, it's, uh, it's understood that what we're really talking about there is being under his covering, etc. So it's kind of written like that. You know, the, you guys remember the song by Gordon Lightfoot called Edmund Fitzgerald, the wreck of Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, it's one of those kind of folk songs from the 60s. Well, that song is a historical thing. The Edmund Fitzgerald was a ship that sank, but it was read, uh, done in a lyrical way. That's kind of the idea there of the book of Job. So I do encourage you to read it. Three chapters a day will get you where you need to be. And uh, so we'll be able to put this in the word, of, the word of God in our hearts deep over these next couple weeks. All right, so let's look at our next slide. A little backstory on the book of Job. Before we dive into some scripture, I want to give you an understanding here. Now, the Bible lists Job as one of the wealthiest people of the East of the time. And it goes off to list in chapter 1 what he owns. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, that's 1,000 oxen, 500 donkeys. And to feed all those livestock, you would have had to have a, a massive grazing area somewhere around at least 13 square miles of property to own to to graze that many animals he also had many servants it said so he had servants and 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 uh, farm hands and farmland and and he had seven sons and seven daughters as well so this would have been a massive wealth of the time and you see here he would have needed barns and houses and so if you do, I did some quick calculations, and it's really hard to do those kinds of things and what those are worth in ancient times versus now. But this would have been, at least, in nowadays money, at least $120 million would have been the net worth of Job. Very, very wealthy. Very wealthy. But one of the neat things about it, Job didn't let that, that money ruin him. God himself says about Job that he is a man of righteousness and integrity. Well, now, when God gives you a compliment like that, that, that really is a compliment, isn't it? See, I hope that God gives me, I don't know, I'm probably going to get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. But goodness gracious, what a compliment to be given. In other words, it meant that he didn't get this money the wrong way. He didn't uh, belittle people or take advantage of people to get this money. He did it in a righteous way. He did it in a God-fearing way with integrity. So the first chapter of the book of Job also shows us um, a, a, a story that happens and in it um, there's a meeting in heaven and in the middle of that meeting 
um, Satan walks in and God points Job out as a righteous man of integrity. And Satan claims that Job is only a good man. He's only a righteous man because of how God keeps blessing him. And, jo and Satan says that if you give me a chance, I'm going to attack him and he will not be a man of God after he loses those things. And Satan sets out to destroy all that Job has and, uh, and to see if Job is going to turn his back on God if he loses what he has. And so that's going to bring us now to Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. Let's read these here together. Verse 13. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the older brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. And verse 15, when the Sabians raided, raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And then in verse 17, while he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. And verse 18, while he was still speaking, yet another messenger arrived with this news. Heartbreaking news, your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. And suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Man, that is, some, that is some tragedy, friends. That is some next level tragedy. Not only did he lose the money, these farmhands that were, were, were killed, they would have all been his friends, some of his best friends, if not his best friends. And, and we can't wrap our head around the de devastation of, of, of this scale. Job losing all his possessions and all his things and his entire family, they're irreplaceable. It's totally irreplaceable. So that is a devastating loss like we have never seen. So let's look at our next slide here. We are like Job in some ways and not like him in other ways. Okay, so we're like Job in some ways and we can relate to the story in some ways, but we're not like Job in some other ways. And let's talk about this for a second. We're like Job because we too experience difficult things, even tragedies. And have you ever noticed that difficult things tend to come in clusters? I call them cluster bombs. And when one thing just goes wrong and it seems like something else is right after that and right after that and right after that and right after that, you know, maybe we, our furnace goes out and then our car's starting making a noise. Oh, great. Well, I, you know, I just had to spend money on my furnace. Now I've got this car. And now I'm not feeling well. Oh, no. I probably got corona. And, you know, we start to think on those things. And uh, maybe, maybe I'm going to give this to everybody and hurt some people. And the people at work are driving you crazy. You know, they've been all quarantined and uh, maybe you're, you're stuck at home and you're frustrated with all the people that are around you. You know, doesn't it seem like these things happen in clusters, kind of in groups? At least it seems like that in my life. You know, and sometimes situations can even be, be more serious, right? The lose, lose our jobs. We suffer a house fire or, or something were to happen on that scale or, or we get hurt and sick and our bodies are never the same. Or even worse, we, 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 we lose a loved one to cancer or, um, we, or someone that we, we love passes away. You know, those tragedies, they do, they do send, tend to come in clusters. Those problems tend to come in clusters. So in a way, we are like Job, that we can re relate to that. But there's ways we're not like Job as well. We're not like Job because this story is in the Bible on purpose just like this. It's on purpose to be an epic loss, a loss that you and I, that is above whatever you and I could have lost. We might have elements of understanding of what Job is going through. We've lost a loved one. We've had, uh, the, you know, something not work. We've lost some money. We've, we've been broke, et cetera. But, but the scale here is purposefully elevated. It's purposefully elevated so that everything is next level because they want, it wants to highlight how Job reacted 
in that situation. And it's supposed to give us an example of how you and I can re relate and uh, how you and I can react differently in situations that are like this. So that's how there are ways that we are like Job and there's ways that we are not like Job. So um, when we go through something that's difficult and, and hard, we can look at the example of Job and how he reacted and look at that as an example of how we ourselves should react in tough times. So our next slide. Where is God when tragedy strikes? Where is God? Maybe you've asked that. Where is God? Where are you, Lord? Well, I'll tell you first off, let me tell you where he's at. He's on his throne. He's on his throne where he's always been, ruling at, over absolutely everything. He was on his throne before there was a universe. Before time began, he was in complete control. Before there was any atom of matter or any speck or particle or any life or any earth or angels, any of that, God was on his throne. And that is where he will always be, on his throne. In the beginning of Job's story, God is on his throne. At the end of Job's story, God is on his throne. Now in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, God is the author and the finisher, the beginning and the ending of our faith. God's the one who started this in our lives, and God's the one who's going to finish this in our lives, friends. So when you're going through times of trouble, where is God? He's at the beginning and the middle and the end of our story. Even if we don't feel like it, if we don't understand it necessarily, I tell you what, he's in the beginning, middle, and end of our story. You see, God, God is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere. And we cannot wrap our little minds around God being everywhere. Not just everywhere in the fact that he's all the places at all at, at, right now. He's at all the places of all time. Layers and layers of time and space. He transcends all of it. He is omnipresent, overseeing everything. He has not missed anything. He is not missing anything. And he will not miss something. So not only is God omnipresent... God is omniscient. That means God knows everything. Everything there is to know. He knows how atoms work. He knows how gravity, he, not only does he know how it works, he created the way that it works, the way that atoms and the nuclear process and neutrons, and he understands all that. Not only does he understand it, he created it to be as it is. He's omniscient. He knows how the universe works. And you know what else he knows? The deepest things of our hearts. He knows the deepest things of you and I's heart. That's pretty cool. He knows us better than we know ourselves. All at the same time, God is omniscient. And not only that, he's omnipotent. Omnipotent. And so he's every, all power, omnipotent, omnipotent, all power. And that means he could destroy every atom in the universe and recreate it in a split second without using any of his extended power i mean to do something small or something big is just the same to god it's all the same because he's got infinite power in reserve at any given moment he's all powerful he has infinite power he can do anything at any time okay why do we say all that because we have to stop and think a little bit here because humans tend to think of ourselves as something bigger than we are. And we also tend to think of God as something smaller than he is. God is bigger than we give him credit for. And we are smaller than we give ourselves credit for. Yes, we are loved. Yes, we are important. And yes, uh, you, God has got a plan for us, etc. But God is so much bigger than we are. So much and we've got to put those things in our hearts friends because it's really really important that we understand the scale of god and how big he is so where is god when tragedy strikes he's working his plan his omnipotent omniscient everywhere plan he's working his plan his plan is beyond you and i's understanding and we've got to learn to have faith and trust the plan by a being that is so immense now what is the enemy doing what is satan doing in this time he's got a plan as well matter of fact better better call it a scheme probably and that scheme is to use our vulnerable state in our tragic difficult troubled times 
he uses those that are vulnerable state to get us off the path that God's got for our lives. Boy, if there's something I'm realizing in this pandemic, it's that we are in a place where we can either go further with God or away from God. We can either dive into the things of God or we can fall back from the things of God. And now is the time to see the scheme of the enemy and the plan of God. See the scheme of the enemy to get us off track and the plan of God to keep us and put us forward when this whole tragedy is over. Okay, so there's something we need to remember here. Our next slide. The main purpose of our lives is not happiness. The main purpose of our lives is not happiness. Now, we tend to think God's point over our lives is to make us happy. But actually, that's not the point at all, friends. The point of our lives is not for us to be the pets that God has in a really nice aquarium, a really nice terrarium, and he feeds us, and he takes care of us, and he makes sure we have a happy little surrounding. That's actually not the point. And many, many people are very frustrated with God because they think that that is the point, and they think God's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. But friends, happiness is not the point, actually. Instead, what is the point? The point is for you and me to know God. That's the point. And if the point is for you and me to know God, well then, trouble, tragedy, difficult times, hey, sometimes those help us to get to know God. I wish it weren't true, but some of the most difficult times in my life have ended up being some of the times where I have pressed into God harder than ever before. And may that be us in this difficult time right here, friends. May we be those that press into God like never before. C.S. Lewis has got a great quote. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Let me say that again. God whispers to us, C.S. Lewis, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He's just barely talking when we're having a good time. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I believe God is rousing a deaf world in the times we are in right here, right now. For many people, before this pandemic, they were not thinking about their lives, what happens to them after they die. They weren't thinking about that. But when you're face to face with a situation which may put your life at risk, and put hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives at risk, guess what? You begin to think about eternity a little better. You begin to think about what goes on after I die. Is there a God in heaven? Is Jesus true? Is the Bible true? And all of those things are important things to be thinking. And I believe God's going to use this pandemic as a megaphone to shake people and rouse them up out of their situation so that God gets the glory and so that people know him. Because that is the purpose. Our next slide here. People say that they can't wait for things to go back to normal. But I don't want things to go back to normal. What? What did he just say? <laughs> yep, that's right. I don't want things to go back to normal. I want things to go better than normal. I want things to be better after this situation than they were before it. If after all this is over, we see more people seeking God than ever before... If we see more people have an appreciation for the people that are around them, we see more people enjoying time spent together. If after this whole thing is over, we value being able to worship God together like we haven't been valuing it lately. If after this whole thing is over, we're looking out for one another like we, we were during that pandemic, then certainly we've now been better after this thing than before it. The enemy would love for us to go back to normal. I pray we never go back to normal. I pray we're better after this situation. There's no doubt this virus is a tragedy and there's been loss of life and our economy's tanking and who knows how that's going to end up. But in the midst of all this, you know what we're also seeing is incredible acts of kindness. We're seeing love for people. We're seeing people help each other, look out for each other, be there for each other, check on each other like we've never seen before. And I tell you what, I pray we never go back to normal. I pray we go way beyond 
where we were before this whole thing happens. Okay, so our next slide, change of pace here. Did you ever watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? You guys remember this show? I mean, it's more of a Gen X kind of a thing. Boy, when I was growing up, this was a big, big deal. Uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Okay, so if you ever watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he was such a kind person. And as, as I grew up, I realized, you know what, that wasn't just a show of him trying to be nice for the kitties. He was really a great person. And really, he was a hero in a lot of ways, and not a hero in, in many ways that people think heroes are, you know, with some kind of superpowers or, you know, saving the day. No, nope, he was a Presbyterian minister. Did you guys know that? He was a Presbyterian minister. And what was he doing? He was ministering to those little kids, showing us all all kinds of neat things and how to take care of each other. So I grew up watching him, and Fred Roger tells a story about when his mother which would, there would be bad things on the news and maybe difficult things on the, on the news at the, on the TV at night. And Fred Rogers would, would, was watching TV or listening to the radio. And you know what his mother said? I'll quote it here. Fred Rogers says, My mother would say to me, Look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I'm always comforted by realizing there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. So every time we see tragedy, difficult, trouble, situations, look for the helpers, because there's always people who are helping. There's always people who are being a blessing at difficult times. See, God's way... God's preferred way of, of helping people is to use other people to help people. God's preferred way to use, uh, of helping people is to use other people. And why does he do that? God can do it any way he wants. He could use an angel. He could just speak. He could change matter. He could do it all how he wants. Why? Because he's actually letting us in on the process. He's being, uh, he's being good to us by letting us be a part of the big thing that he's doing he lets us in on the big secret he lets us be his sons and daughters so in tragedies see god activates people to be his hands and feet he prefers using us people to be his hands and feet to bring comfort to bring provision to put their arms around people i guess we'd have to do that maybe maybe spiritually not necessarily actually putting our arms around people right now but being there for them in their very difficult times. Now, I know for me, um, there have been different, different tragedies or different situations that I've gone through. There have been some that uh, it were my own issues, my lack of wisdom. Maybe I didn't make a decision like I was supposed to make it. Maybe I didn't listen. Maybe I disobeyed God or whatever, and something came around my, my way. And some of them, I didn't do anything to, to, to instigate. And sometimes there are people that even though I've helped them maybe or been there for them in various ways, they, they, they then, eh, how do I say it? They then don't reciprocate that same help back to me maybe in my time of need. And you know what I've realized? I tend to remember, and maybe this is you too, but I tend to remember the people that hurt me more than I remembered the people that have helped me. And that is really unfair to all those wonderful people that have helped me. Because I've been helped hundreds of times, and I've been betrayed a handful of times. But boy, I can remember those betrayals much more than I can remember the helping. And I'm deciding, and hopefully you're with me here today, you're deciding and I'm deciding that today, you know what? We are going to be those who remember those wonderful people who God used to be the helpers around us in our difficult times. And even in this situation, this pandemic, I'm so proud of our church, Church of the Heartland. So proud of our campuses. We've been helping people. We've been loving people. We've been there for each other. People have been supporting me and supporting the church and supporting with their finances and with their giving. It's just really been amazing to see. You know why? Because we've said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to rally together. We're going to grab each other up in this time, and we are going to make it through together. And I tell you what, it's been inspiring to me to see it, friends very inspiring and i want to remember those helpers not the herders 
not the ones who have hurt me, but the ones who have helped me. I'm choosing to remember the good today. So our next slide, how would we react if we faced the level of loss that Job did? How would you and I react if you and I were faced with a level of loss? Let's remember the level of loss. All of his worth uh, gone, money all gone, co-workers all dead, friends all gone, and worst of all, his family now deceased, his children, his irreplaceable seven sons and three daughters all gone. How would you and I respond? I don't know. And you know, I found something about empathy. I try to empathize with people as they're going through difficult situations. Maybe you, you do too. I bet you do. So we try to empathize with people that are going through difficult situations, but we can only get so far in our empathy. Our heart will not open itself to the point where we really can see exactly what they're feeling. And we've heard this, oh, I know what you're feeling. We really don't. Because our own heart and mind will not open up the floodgates of pain to really grasp. Sometimes we get just a sliver of it, but we're not grasping it, uh, someone else's pain. And then when we feel it ourselves, when these things happen to us, now it hits home. Now it really does hit home. It really is difficult. And we really do feel it on the deepest levels of our heart, friends. So how would we face it in the middle of our tragedy, a Job-level tragedy? What if God appeared right in front of you? What would you do? Would you blame him? Would you be mad at him? Would you ask him questions? Would you be emotional about it? I probably would be. I'm not sure what I'd do. I'm hoping I would say the right things. I'm not sure what I'd do of a tragedy of that level. Boy, I'd be emotional. Satan believed that Job would curse God and Job would turn his back on God and that's why those things happened. And I want to look at now three more scriptures out of Job chapter 1, verse 20, 21, and 22. It says, Job stood up after he heard this tragic things, and he tore his robe in grief, and he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground to worship. And he said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. And verse 22, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Wow, that's a powerful thought, friends. Our next slide here. We need to worship in our time of trouble. Did you notice that he worshiped God? Those messengers came. I think there's four messengers, one right after another, just with worse news, one after the other. And Job tears his robe and falls to his knees and worships God. And we too need to worship in our time of trouble. You're not going to feel like it. You're not going to want to do it. You've got to kind of press through with that one, friends. You've got to kind of press through with that. Notice that Job leaned into God and not away from God in his time of trouble. He leaned into God. He said, you're the one that's going to turn this whole thing around. You're all I've got now, God. Frequently, you see people tearing their garments in the Bible. It was, it was a way of showing the emotion that they were feeling. And I, and I want you to let you know it was not wrong that Job was emotional about it. You know, it's okay to be angry or sorrowful or depressed or disappointed or frustrated it's okay to be emotional about it it's just what we do with those emotions actually maybe, let me say it this way it's not what we do it's where we focus those emotions because sometimes we're so frustrated and we're so angry and then we take it out on those people around us well friends let's not do that that's not fair to them that's not fair to them we put don't, don't put the blame on them and then we're so frustrated and we're so angry and we tear in our clothes and we're blaming God. Let's not do that either. Let's just be broken and, and frustrated about the situation and not necessarily take that and aim it at a person. You know, the old kick the dog syndrome. It's not the dog's fault. Don't aim it at a person or, or anything or a drywall. You're busting holes in the drywall. No, take it. It's okay. You're, 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 you're emotional. God's not saying to not be emotional. He's just saying don't put the blame on other people for what's going on. Don't put the blame on him for what's going on. See, why is it so important where the reaction is focused? Why is that so important? It's so important because we need to re, uh, react appropriately to the people around us and we need to react appropriately to the lord because those are the things god's going to use to bring about the comfort that we need 
And if we are constantly projecting out onto other people to blame, God can't use those people to be the comfort that we need. We're shutting off ourselves from the very people that God wants to use to comfort us in our time. We're shutting him off from his ability to comfort us in our difficult time. See, Job didn't worship God because he liked what happened. See, sometimes we worship God because we, we like the direction our life is going. Job didn't worship God because he liked the direction this was going. He worshiped God because God is on the throne. Because God is that big. Because God is the beginning, the middle, and the end of his story. And the middle sounded like it was pretty rough, but he knows the end is still coming. The end, something good is going to be turned around somehow from this, and therefore Job worshiped God. Our application slide for us today, here's how we can apply this. We can be careful not to blame God when hard times come. Be careful not to blame God when hard times come. It's easy to do. You can even ask questions. You can even ask questions. But there's not a blame uh, inside of that. It's, Lord, just explain this to me. I'm not, I, I don't understand. I'm, I have a limited mind, a limited intellect. I don't understand. That's different than the, than the blame. And the second part, excuse me, the second part, worship in our time of trouble. Worship in our time of trouble. When, you, when, you, when you're going through those tragedies, when you're going through those difficult times, worship. Fall to your knees and worship. And I've been trying to put this into practice here, and it's not been easy. It doesn't come necessarily easily. But boy, on the other side of that worship time, friends, you can just feel that God begins to pick us up and carry us. God begins to heal our hearts and turn our hearts back towards him. So here's what I'd like to do right now. I'd like for us to pray together if we could. I'd like for us to pray for the difficult times that many of us here are going through. I'd like for us to pray that each of us can respond properly and react properly in these difficult times and that we can be the helpers that God wants us to be into helping other people through their situations as well. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, we pray right now for everyone that's going through a difficult time right here. We've got a pandemic across the globe and we're asking, Lord Jesus, for you to help in this very, very difficult time. God, I thank you that you are working right now, and we don't see you, but you're working. We don't understand how it is, but you're working. And I pray, God, that in the middle of this dark time, I pray, God, that you help us, help us, help us to worship you first, to worship you first. Help us to be those that instinctively worship, that when we're in dark times, when we're in troubled times, when we're in tragic times, we fall to our knees cry out to you with every emotion we've got and worship you jesus because you are still on the throne because our story's not finished yet and that is our prayer today in jesus name